I'm Charles Payne. I'm Kat Timp. I'm Stuart Varney, and this is the Fox News Rundown. Friday, April 28, 2023. I'm Jessica Rosenthal. The president says he'll run again in 2024, all while acknowledging what the polls say about that. Republicans react with sharp criticism as Congress battles over the debt ceiling. He's got Democrats now saying, OK, we understand, you know, you don't want to negotiate over the debt ceiling, but we have to do something now. You said Republicans need to put something on the table. They have. We talk about the week with Fox News Sunday host Shannon Breen. I'm Chris Foster. Mortgage fees are going up for some borrowers with good credit and down for some people with lower credit scores. It's meaningful, and I think a lot of people question the basic fairness of saddling people who have done everything right, presumably, with this extra cost. And I'm Mary Harrington. I've got the final word on the Fox News Rundown. This week, lawmakers in the U.S. House battled over the debt ceiling. Republicans narrowly passed a bill along party lines that would raise the debt limit through March of next year, but with large spending cuts attached. Democrats, like House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, said going back to 2022 spending levels would harm working Americans, veterans, seniors, and children. The Default on America Act is a ransom No. House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Jason Smith said the Republican cuts are common sense. It puts real limits on future spending so that we begin to turn the ship back in a more fiscally sound direction. It was a week chock full of congressional hearings as well. Republicans examined pandemic school closures. Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic Chairman Brad Wenstrup questioned the head of the American Federation of Teachers, Randy Weingarten. But despite all this science, AFT still wanted to install some way to automatically close schools which deviates from the narrative of doing everything we can to get them open. Weingarten said she was in touch with the CDC and consulted doctors on best practices. We know that kids learn best in person. But before all of that, Americans heard from President Joe Biden that he is officially running in 2024 for a second term. While he made it official in a video, he was asked about his reelection bid while hosting the president of South Korea, specifically about polling that indicates most don't want him to run again, and many cite his age as a factor. One of the things that people are going to find out, they're going to see a race, and they're going to judge whether or not I have it or don't have it. I respect them taking a hard look at it. I take a hard look at it as well. I took a hard look at it before I decided to run. While he has two Democratic challengers, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and author Marianne Williamson, the Democratic National Committee has said they don't plan on hosting debates. Gosh, there's so many interesting polling numbers out there on this this week. Not surprising. Shannon Bream is the host of Fox News Sunday. Fox News, our new poll, when we ask among Democratic primary voters, who do you want to vote for? The current president gets 62 percent. Hey, that's solid. That's very good. But RFK Jr. gets 19 percent. I mean, that's almost a fifth of primary voters are like, oh, I'm going to pick some other guy who probably doesn't have a real chance of winning. That's how much I don't want my current president, the leader of my party, to actually be the nominee the next time around. You mentioned the age thing. You look at the CBS News polling when they're asked for reasons. And these are people who are lean Democrat independents or Democrats. Um, what are your concerns about and you, why you think he shouldn't run? Number one, his age. Number two, time for someone new. And number three, I like other Democrats more. So, I mean, his approval rating is not good. Any poll that you look at. But there's real consternation within his own party that they want someone else. They're not happy with him. But listen, if he's the guy, I don't think that most Democrats are going to jump across the aisle and vote for the GOP nominee. The question is whether they just decide to stay home if there's no enthusiasm. Mm. Do we see any pivots, though, from this president as he campaigns for a second time in 2024? It it sounds like he's saying, just watch me. I'll be out on the campaign trail Mm -hmm. um, and you guys can judge for yourselves. But I mean, now that he's seen the polling and we've all seen the polling, does he make himself more visible, available? Well, a lot of people are wondering about that, like how much more we're going to see from him. So we had this presser with him uh, and the South Korean president who are visiting Um, the same week that he's announced. But to really sit there and go at it with the press is not something he does very much. I mean, he lags way behind all recent presidents in availability. All of the press corps is complaining. They all want to see more of this president. He's going to have to get out there on the campaign trail. Um, Listen, COVID changed everything in 2020, and running from your basement is not going to be an option this time. So there will be a real look for voters to have a chance to see him in action, how he 
is on the campaign trail, how he is with people, how he is with this grueling schedule of events. Well, also, to be fair, being the leader of the free world, it's a lot for any person. So um, I think he's going to have to get out there. Certainly much more than 2020. And this, I mean, as we were told earlier this week by a, a former Biden surrogate in 2020, you know, he'll, he will be president likely still at that time when he's running mm-hmm. and that's visibility mm-hmm. in its own right. Um, right. Shannon, the reaction from Republicans, it was very stark. I mean, former President Trump was talking about like World War III in his reaction. Mm. Um, the RNC had a fully AI generated ad that was full of very dark dystopian images. I, I wonder... Was that too over the top or does that resonate maybe with some persuadables who maybe feel like Mm -hmm. things are tenuous right now with Russia, China, banks, inflation, you name it? Yeah, and you you and I know, we've covered this enough, that people will tell you they hate negative, scary ads, but then all the data will show you that they work. So people Mm -hmm. may say they don't like that stuff, but both sides know that appealing to fear, often people will vote out of that versus a positive uplifting message. This is kind of what Senator Tim Scott is out there testing in the field. Will people Mm. respond to this message of faith and hope and pulling together and counting on each other and staying away from name calling? And, you know, I don't know. I mean, he feels like he's seen enough. He's got that exploratory committee now. But the fact is the dark, fearful ads work. History proves it. And for whatever reason, human nature seems to be persuaded by that. You mentioned the Fox News poll. It it did, as we've noted and we've seen, found former President Trump with a double-digit lead over Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And and DeSantis noted while in Japan, hey, I'm not even a candidate yet. But -hmm. this poll also found broadly more people think banning books and not being accepting enough of transgender families are more important than trans kids competing on girls' sports teams or discussions about race in the classroom. For, for those like DeSantis who maybe would focus on those kinds of issues in a presidential campaign, what do you think he and other Republicans maybe should glean from this kind of polling? Mm-hmm. I think probably DeSantis is one of these guys who, uh, they all say this, like, I don't care about polls. I mean, he really demonstrated that mm-hmm. during COVID. He was willing to do what he thought in his assessment of going through scientific materials and studies and talking to experts. I mean, he'll say, I make the decisions that I believe from my core are the right decisions. Now, in Florida, they've done a lot of this, and he won by 19 points after barely right. squeaking out a minor percentage, fraction of a percentage point in his initial election. So right. I think he's going to feel very emboldened, like, listen, I've got my finger on the pulse of this stuff. The Floridians who turned out in droves and basically turned the state from purplish to solid red, what I did in Florida will work on a national stage. I mean, that's what he's been out testing around the country. So um, yes, the you know, Florida blueprint, that, right? Yeah. And I think that he's going to make the argument that it will work nationally. He knows in some states that's not going to work. Those states may be ones that, listen, I don't know in my lifetime if we'll see a Republican presidential candidate win California or New York. (laughs) So, you know, they may just go ahead and take those off the table. But he knows in other states and across the South, the Midwest, important places, the polling may be very different. And he's willing to, I think, if he gets in, ride that path and to stand by it. A lot of oxygen taken up on the Hill this week with the debt ceiling debate. Republicans Mm -hmm. did vote to raise the the debt limit, along with a a bunch of spending cuts, though. That's obviously tied in there. It doesn't seem like it will go anywhere, right? A Democratic-controlled Senate. The president's not going to sign it. But I guess it was meant to show, according to the analysts, that, that Republicans can stick together and that the president should negotiate. We don't have much time, it sounds like, according to the Mm -hmm. Treasury Secretary. So what will the president do now? Well, even with his own in his own party, he's got Democrats now saying, OK, we understand, you know, you don't want to negotiate over the debt ceiling, but we have to do something now. You said Republicans need to put something on the table. They have uh, the speaker against most odds pulled together enough of these votes to actually pass something. So that gives him something to go to the table with. Like, hey, you said we need to come together on something. Here's what we've got. He knows he's not going to get everything in there. Democrats know they're probably not going to get everything in there. So the two sides are going to have to come together. I mean, this what the speaker pulled off is to his credit and the critics who said he couldn't do it. Now he has something that forces the president's hand. And when you have Democrats now publicly calling on him to say, you got to get it together, we at least have to have some kind of conversations. The pressure is on now from both sides. And interesting to me, too, that several Senate Republicans have come out to say, like, hey, we stand with the House. Great job by the speaker, because they've kind of hung back and let him do his thing. Yes. But it cuts off that avenue if the White House wanted to try to go to the Senate GOP directly and have negotiations with them. The Senate now casting with the House and supporting what Speaker 
uh, McCarthy did means that the White House doesn't have that avenue. Got it. Uh, just a couple more for you. We, other than the congressional debate on the debt limit, we had plenty of hearings, as I'm sure you saw. Um, and we heard from Randy Weingarten, the head of the American Federation of Teachers, took a lot of heat over the um, school closures during COVID, going back and forth with Republicans in, in a sort of high profile hearing and, and really tried to defend herself, saying she was consulting with doctors and the CDC and Republicans said her guidance was too draconian. I guess schools were closed for too long. But I suppose the question would be out of a hearing like that, then what now? Like, God forbid there's another pandemic. Would anything be different? Did we learn anything? I mean, did we learn anything from this hearing mm. that they've learned anything about if we have to pivot or do something else? Uh, God forbid we have another pandemic. Yeah, gosh, I think that people lost so much faith in public institutions. And when you mm -hmm. find out that people were having back channel conversations and things that they played dumb about, they'd already kind of negotiated behind closed doors. You know, those kinds of things. What I heard from are all my mama bear friends this week who had school age children who were living through this in real time, who are furious about their kids lost year or two, depending on where they lived um, and feeling like Randy Weingart now is coming out and trying to gaslight them. That's that's the phrase I'm hearing from some of these mama friends who are like, listen, there were states who moved forward and had kids in school. There were private schools who had you know, safety structures in place. And, you know, when there was a positive test, they had, you know, their own way to handle this and to, you know, keep the kids safely in. They feel like she was about the union and not about the kids. And they feel like she was caught in a lot of things that weren't especially transparent. And so unfortunately, what I think is if this happens again in our lifetime, heaven forbid, that there's going to be so much skepticism about following um, yeah. you know, the teachers unions or following the CDC or following the White House, no matter who is running those things, um, left, right or center. I think, gosh, parents who live through the last couple of years of this, very angry and very skeptical. Got to hit on a foreign policy note before we leave. Um, president Biden, as you noted earlier, met with South Korea's president. They pledged to work together on a number of items, especially concerning our national security and with North Korea. But as that was happening, I guess China's president, Xi Jinping talked to Ukraine's president for the first time since this war began. Um, and it was reported that she said, you know, we don't want to add fuel to the fire. We want to end this war peacefully and help you do that. Do U.S. officials buy that and believe that Xi Jinping or Chinese officials will not help Russia out in the duration of this war, whatever's left remaining of it? Yeah, they feel like if that was true, that China didn't want to give any advantage at all to Russia, they would really crack down on dual use items like drones and others that aren't necessarily lethal aid or weaponry, but can be mm. used for the battlefield. They think China needs to be much clearer about that. And they don't like this idea that China is going around the world trying to be the mediator of, you know, issues in the Middle East. Now the war in Ukraine. It's the last thing that U.S. Uh, lawmakers and leaders in the White House want is for Xi to be now showing up as if he is the one to bring people together, to bring, you know, broken mm -hmm. factions together and to be a, a bomb on the you know wounds of the world. I mean, that's the last thing they want. They don't want to be boxed out of Europe where he's trying to do it or Africa or anywhere else. So I think the last thing that they want to see is Xi stepping up to say, I'm the one who's going to you know, get this thing done. Although I think everybody agrees, maybe other than Putin, they want this thing over. Fox News Sunday host Shannon Bream, thanks for joining. Great to be with you. This is Mary Harrington with your Fox News commentary coming up. One size does not fit all with mortgages. Rates and fees are affected by loan size, the down payment, income, even where the house is. There are also credit scores taken into account. Better credit gets you a better deal, lower credit a worse deal. That's still true, but some of the gap is being closed by the Federal Housing Finance Agency. Starting May 1st, it's lowering fees for people with the very, very best credit, creating new high-end tiers for those borrowers. But fees for some borrowers with just good credit are going up, with less of a penalty for people with only fair credit. Unfair, says North Carolina House Republican Patrick McHenry on Fox Business. Well, when the administration is trying to reprice mortgages and make uh, higher creditworthy people pay a higher mortgage rate than those that are less creditworthy, it shows that they are trying to manipulate the market for their political purposes. He's co-signed a letter threatening legislation if the new rules aren't changed. So this is important to anybody who has any interest in buying a housing ever, okay? This is a new rule, goes into effect next month. 
Fox Business anchor and reporter Jerry Willis, also the host of the podcast Fearless and Proud. What this policy is all about is helping people who are low income, have not so great credit scores, buy a house. You might imagine politically this is a very popular thing, right? Mm -hmm. But here's the downside of that. The people who are going to pay for that, make up the difference for that, are the people who have great credit scores and have put down significant down payments and are good credits. This could be 40 bucks a month for those folks over the course of a 30-year loan. Presumably they don't hold it that long, but it's meaningful. And I think a lot of people question the basic fairness of saddling people who have done everything right, presumably, with this extra cost. Now, the people at the Federal Housing uh, Finance Authority, they say, look, this isn't It's not cause and effect. We're not raising one to lower another, that this is all just algorithms and math, and there's lots of factors that go into it, but I don't know. So I don't know. These things get adjusted every now and then, and I I don't know what I don't know what goes into it. So I stand back 100 paces, Mm -hmm. and I think what you see over and over and over again, whether it's a Democratic administration or a Republican administration, our efforts to make it easier for low-income people, presumably people with lower credit scores, to get housing. That's what caused the 2006-2008, in part, housing crisis, because we were trying to give everybody a mortgage, and there weren't enough people who qualified. So then we started using no-doc and low-doc loans and all that kind of thing. So basically, it starts with policy, and I find that folks out there often believe that it generally has a bad impact. I think you'd have to say the housing crash was a bad impact. Of course. Now, but is this, is there enough of an impact on the lower end here to to cause concern? Well, that's a really interesting question because when I talk to housing experts about this, what they told me is, look, at the end of the day, if they put this program in place and, and they can actually write some loans on this, Ultimately, they're just going to raise prices at the lower end because the real problem, as I'm sure you know, is there's no inventory, particularly at the low end. There's no housing for anybody to buy. So as soon as you start flooding that market with mortgages, those prices go higher, higher. How's the housing market in general? Where are we for buyers and sellers? Not great. It's not the housing market is not great, but it's not like it's 2006 and 2007 and 2008 all over again. It is not. However... Home prices have come down and are continuing to come down, particularly in those markets that did so well during COVID. We're seeing double-digit declines in prices. Sales of homes, that's lower as well. And, you know, I just have to tell you there's a number out this week, uh, pending home sales, which is actually a forward-looking indicator. There aren't a lot of those in housing, and it's mm-hmm. a problem because it takes a long time for housing to generate numbers, right? Because you get you sign the mortgage, and then uh, like months later, it actually, right. you know. So pending home sales are down 5.2 percent, uh, we learned this week. And that means the housing market's going to go sideways for a while here, right? Because we don't have as many mortgages coming through. We just had higher mortgage rates uh, I believe 6.9%. You can correct me if I'm wrong. That's a big, big jump in just like a year, year and a half, right? Right. We had some softer uh, rates come through, but now we're coming back up again. And basically the bottom line is that interest rates and prices have essentially doubled for buyers yeah. over the last two years. Yeah. Is there an opportunity here if you have the money and you can afford the higher interest rates because if because if prices are down, is there an opportunity to buy low and then just kind of ride it and then refinance, but you've got that original low price. Well, the problem is there's no inventory. (laughs) I mean, the problem you're consistently up against is you may not be able to find the home that you want. Now, having said that, there are a lot of people in the marketplace doing exactly what you're suggesting. People are still coming in with offers. You still have lots of homes that are receiving multiple bids, particularly in the middle of the country. Again, real estate is really a local business, right? What's going on in some of these go-go markets that we've seen over time, out west, Florida, it's not the story everywhere, right? Yeah, I mean, we talk about these. These are obviously national figures we keep talking about in very broad strokes, but you're right. What's happening in New York City isn't happening in Tallahassee, isn't happening in Omaha or Tulsa or, or wherever. Moving on, other stuff. New GDP numbers are out. The economy's slowing down. Uh, too much, too fast. The Fed's been trying to do this. They want to tame inflation. How are they doing? 
The number up 1.1 percent was a disappointment to Wall Street, and it doesn't bode well for what we're seeing for the balance of the year, I don't think. I think we could continue to see, you know, plateauing, flatlining, even negative uh, GDP. We could see a recession here. I know a lot of people are baking that in right now. I mean, if you're a consumer out there, I think the thing is you got to keep your head up. you got to watch what's going on and not extend yourself financially. I know a lot of people are buying things on time. They're bolstering their credit um, card debt. If you can avoid it, do it. So if the Fed's goal is to decrease in, uh, inflation, how is the balancing act? doing is is it coming down as fast as they want it it's to be it's not com- it's not coming down as fast as they okay. want it's so, it's sticky inflation is always sticky it's hard to get rid of because it gets caught up in the wage cycle and t- feeds itself and that's what we've seen we're going to have to wait and see this play out i you know look the federal reserve's going to come in with another quarter point rate cut people are getting squeezed and all that and that gets back to the housing thing um even if like you said it's 40 bucks a month or whatever for a lot of borrowers, if you add that to the interest rates, it's, it'll add up. It all adds up. And I think people are really feeling the weight of inflation at the grocery store. We've got gas prices going up now. That's another burden that people are seeing. And then when you poll folks, they're really starting to talk about this now. And you see people doing things, they other choices they otherwise wouldn't make because of these high prices for yeah. everything. You mentioned the poll, our new Fox News poll. Um uh, for your family, it feels like the economy is getting better, 23% getting worse, 70%, you know, obviously underwater numbers there, staying uh, the same 6%. Just arbitrarily looking back to 2017, 42% of people thought it was getting better, and 37% thought it was getting worse, 18% same. So people's perception and or their actual experience right now is a little is a little rough. It's a little rough. And, you know, keep in mind, this is cumulative, Right. You see uh, prices go up 3% one month, and then the next month they go up 3% again. That's on top of what you've already baked in. Mm -hmm. So it's this cumulative experience that people have that you feel like, wow, things are spiraling out of control. And it's not like, I mean, it's rare that you see those negative inflation numbers, right? So this just continues and continues, puts a lot of strain on the family household budget. People have to try to find a way out of that box. They've got high student loan debt, credit card debt. Uh, now 20% interest rate on that. It's it's a it's a burden. We've talked about in the past um, the struggles of commercial real estate right now. Mm-hmm. How is the I, there are there's talk and some movement about turning some of that stuff into housing stock. Mm-hmm. It can be difficult to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've talked to anybody about it. Is, is there is there enough out, think, is there enough out there to, to ease that some of that strain? So there's probably enough. Yeah, sure to do that, but it costs money, yeah. right? And you have to be zoned for it, right? I mean, there are hurdles that you have to overcome. I did talk to somebody this week, though, about trying to get over that inventory crunch. Like, okay, if the real problem is that we don't have enough houses on the market, how do we solve that? And the best minds that I've talked to say, you really need, this needs to be a local endeavor because you have to zone for it. And what we need to build are multifamily homes, not single family homes, but places, condos, townhouses, where people can live in smaller spaces, the price is lower. And that means that the community has to be okay with that. Yeah, you tell, And it's often a problem. Yeah, you tell that to a lot of people in suburbia who say, I don't want the character of my town ruined by... An apartment building, this is a single-family hometown. And if everybody says that, then there you go. Then you don't have apartment buildings and people – there's just not enough housing stock for the, – the housing stock, I assume, over the decade just hasn't grown as fast as we need it to. It's a longer-term problem than yeah. that, frankly. Uh, it's a multi-decade problem. It has to do with zoning. It has to do with the fact that we've already built out a lot of uh, available land. It has to do with people moving to different cities than they used to live in. Uh, it, I mean, it's really compounding, and I think – You know, increasingly people will get more creative and use other options, shopping malls, apartment buildings, uh, they'll use office buildings, but that takes money and zoning and planning and time too. But to stuff people into mortgages where you manufacture the costs of that mortgage, probably not the right way to go. Uh, Jerry Willis, Fox Business. You can listen to her podcast as well. Fearless and Proud is that series. Uh, Jerry, good to talk to you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. And now... 
some good news with Tanya J. Powers. An overdue library book is back in the hands of the Mercer County, New Jersey library system. 44 years past the date it should have been returned. The book, called Back to Basics by the editors of Flying Magazine, was checked out in 1979, due back on July 25th that year. Earlier this month, it made its way back to the library in a box of donations that was dropped off at one of the branches. No word on who returned it or where it's been this whole time. If you're wondering what kind of fine a book that's been checked out for about 16,000 days would rack up, you're not alone. The library's current overdue rate is 10 cents, which equals out to about $1,600. However, the library caps the overdue fine at six bucks. As for what's going to happen to the book now, the library says they'll keep it and may use it in some displays from time to time. Tanya J. Powers, Fox News. Hey, it's Will Kane, co-host of Fox & Friends Weekend. Join me as I share my thoughts on a wide range of topics, from sports and pop culture to politics and business. The Will Kane Podcast. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. It's time for your Fox News commentary. Mary Harrington. What's on your mind? Fifteen years ago, I was living in a queer commune. I'm calling myself Sebastian. I spent hours on message boards angrily defending the queer theory belief that gender is a performance. Funny how things change. Recently, my book, Feminism Against Progress, was due to launch at a venue in New York City. But then the venue cancelled the event booking at short notice following anonymous social media pressure. What was my thought crime? Saying in public that humans can't change sex and that performing gender surgery on kids is butchery. No doubt the me of 15 years ago, Sebastian, would have been cheering on this cancellation. So how did I end up doing such a 180? The story begins at Oxford University in Great Britain in the late 1990s. There, as an undergrad majoring in English literature, I met woke theories for the first time and jumped right in. I believed it all and I set about realising its ideas in my own life. Within the worldview I'd adopted, every form of commitment, stability and structure felt oppressive. I thought feminism meant being independent, constrained only by what I wanted to do. I should be free of expectations, limits or obligations connected to being a woman, even the limits of my physical body. Above all, I should not be expected to limit myself to being a mum. The feminists of the having it all era taught me that doing so would be evidence of my oppression. To be just a mum was a kind of failure. After my daughter was born, though, I realised it wasn't that simple. First, I learned that independence and freedom don't really compute when you're pregnant. There's no more pretending you can do just what you like, whenever you like. Talking about independence in that context makes no sense. This realisation drove me to rethink everything I believed about feminism. Why was a movement supposedly for women selling me on a kind of freedom that's worse than useless for mums? Are mums not women? Delving into the history of the women's movement, I came to see that it used to make plenty of space for mums. In its early days, the movement included women who defended care and motherhood and the reality of our sexed bodies. It also included women who sought freedom on the same terms as men. These two camps often disagreed, but between them, they sought to defend women's interests as the world modernised. But in the mid-20th century, freedom kicked care off the field. It happened when abortion was legalised, in the name of the feminism of freedom. And ever since, this has been the orthodox feminist view, that freedom is everything, that it must be defended at all costs. No wonder this feminism has a mum-shaped blind spot. Pretty much by definition, being a mum means limiting your freedom in the name of love. And this feminism of freedom at any costs has, in fact, many costs. And it's the driving force behind gender ideology. For if freedom is everything, and we're not free unless we can escape every limit of our sexed bodies, why should this only apply to women? Why not grant everyone the freedom to be whichever sex they like? But the brutal truth is that we can't have that freedom any more than we can change the basic biological drives that underpin desire, reproduction and motherhood. Every cell in our body has a sex, and our sex still constrains who we can be, and even what we want, in ways that have nothing to do with culture or power or oppression. This is not born of ignorance or bigotry. It's the fruit of experience. I learned the hard way that more tech and more freedom doesn't mean more happiness. If there's one thing I hope for, with Feminism Against Progress, it's that a few young women may read it and figure this out more quickly than I did. 
and that they'll join me in taking the women's movement back from the empty, toxic illusions of freedom at any price. This is Mary Harrington, author of Feminism Against Progress. You've been listening to the Fox News Rundown. And now, stay up to date by subscribing to this podcast at foxnewspodcasts.com. Listen ad-free on Fox News Podcasts Plus on Apple Podcasts. And Prime members can listen to the show ad-free on Amazon Music. And for up-to-the-minute news, go to foxnews.com. Precise, personal, powerful. Is America's weather team in the palm of your hands? Get Fox weather updates throughout your busy day, every day. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you get your podcasts.